Hello everybody. Hello YouTube. Hello art history enthusiasts and visual culture aficionados. It's me again, Miss M, and I'm back with another video. This time about something a little bit more art history related, something that more closely resembles an actual art history lecture. I'm going to talk about Mesopotamian art today. Uh, two pieces, actually, specifically. Um, I'm starting the video art. Oh, sorry. I'm starting the video out on the front page of my channel. Here we are, the object of art. And this is just the front page. Let me click on the video tab just to sort of let you know you're in the right place. And it says here, Introduction to Mesopotamian Art, and in subsequent videos after this one, that again you can probably figure out that I I recorded this before or after some of the other ones that you will probably see on this uploads <clears throat> excuse me uploads page, and I promised that I would do this one. Victory Steely of Naramshin, and I am going to do that one, but not today. Uh, for some reason, I don't know what got into me, but I said, I want to talk about Inanna today. I want to talk about her. Her. Inanna. This is probably Inanna. This work of art is called The Mask of Varka. Uh, named after, as it says here, named after the modern village of Varka located close to the ancient city of Uruk, uh, also known, she's also known as the Lady of Uruk. So, I want to talk about her today, and I will probably, probably talk about this one next time in my next video for my Mesopotamian series or playlist or whatever you want to call it. And today, I just want to kind of concentrate on, again, her, Inanna. And this work, The Mask of Varka, or The Lady of Uruk, whatever you want to call it. And this one, The Varka Vase. You can see it here. This is, this is a photo of it. It's, these, both of these works, if you're taking, um, and you see I've been doing control F searches here, so I'm gonna, pop that out of there. But um, I always prepare for these videos. I don't know if I prepare well enough or good enough or ugh, I, don't, I don't know. I don't know. But I try. I try to do what I can with what I've got. And the way I make these videos, you know, I've got the internet. I've got the whole world at my fingertips. At least the whole world that's available on the internet. Um, I wish I had more, but maybe that's just me being greedy. And I prepare and I line up all my little tabs and my Wikipedia articles. And today we're going to have, hmm, let's see, we're going to have Wikipedia. Yes, we are. But we're going to have a little more than Wikipedia, a couple extra articles uh, in, in addition to the Wikipedia ones, and I use the Wikipedia ones because they're publicly available. There's, you don't have to pay to see them. You don't have to sign up for Wikipedia to look at Wikipedia articles. All you have to do is search it and there it is. And again, they provide a really good um, condensed version of whatever the official story is regarding this, that, or the other subject, item, place, thing, what have you. That's why I use it. If you are interested in learning more about whatever it is that I'm talking about in any of my videos where I feature or use Wikipedia pages to help me, to aid in my discussion of whatever it is that I'm discussing, well, you go scroll down here to the references part, because I know people say all kinds of stuff about Wikipedia. <clears throat> and some of it I agree with. But one thing that they do is that they provide references and external links and, 
you know, if you click on these, if it happens to be an online source or resource, there it is. They've even, for the love of Pete, they, look at this, they've, for this particular article on the Vorka vase, they've included gardeners art through the ages. Well, 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 I'm tempted to click on this. Let me just go ahead and do it, see what happens. Archive.org. Well, what do you know? Who'd have thunk? Who'd have thunk? Who'd have thunk? Who'd have thunk? I wouldn't have thunk. Not in a million years. But there they did it. And let me click back. Of archives. Because I do have slides from this publication that I'm afraid to use because I don't want to get another copyright strike. I already told you what happened with my first Shining video. Thankfully, YouTube and Warner Brothers reviewed my dispute and they decided to lift my copyright strike and I thank them very much for that. But I don't know how these people would react. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Fred Kleiner and Kristen J. Mamia Gardeners. This is the standard. Gardeners is the standard for art history classes, particularly survey art history classes, art history 101, 102, uh, maybe even art appreciation. Um, this is a video about Inanna, but look at me going off on a tangent already. But this, this textbook, <laughs> ask me how I know, this textbook is, it's been around for years, almost a century, maybe coming up on a century. I think the original version of this. Te Why is it called Gardner's Art Through the Ages? Because a woman named Helen Gardner was the one who got started with this thing. In 19... I think the first edition was published in 1926, so when I said it's almost a hundred years old, I wasn't kidding. So she's... we're just four years off of, of 100 years of this book in all of its different editions, many, many, many editions being the standard textbook used in art history classes, at least in the United States. I can't say for the rest of the world. I'm just talking about the United States. And I don't even know about Canada. I'm not familiar with Canada. If you're a Canadian and you're listening to this and you know, let me know. Do they use gardeners in Canadian um, college classes for art history? Or even high school. Now they have advanced placement classes for art history in high school. So, you know, education is changing. Anyway, let me get back to the topic at hand. Uh, Inanna. And now I'm featuring the Varkaves. Okay. And I'll, get, I'll read this quickly. The Varkaves or Urukaves is a slim carved alabaster vessel found at the temple complex of the Sumerian goddess Inanna in the ruins of the ancient city of Uruk located in the modern Al-Mutana governorate in southern Iraq. Like the Uruk trough and the Narmer palette from Egypt, it is one of the earliest surviving works of narrative relief sculpture dedicated... What did I say? Dedicated. I'm so sorry. It's late. It's late. Dated. Dated to circa 3200 to 3000 BC. Simple relief sculptures also known from much earlier period, periods from the site of Gobekli Tepe dating to circa 9000 BC. So, and where did they get this? Yep. Sorry. I was speaking with my mouth over uh, my hand over my mouth. Where did they get this? Gardeners. That's where they got that information. Gardeners are through the ages. Ugh, I don't know how I feel about that. When I saw that, it just threw me totally off. But <clears throat> And then it explains what is on each register. And when it says, re what's a register? A uh, register is these different levels on the, on the work. This can, you know, in this case, it has to do with this vase. But it can be like wall art in tombs or temples. Uh, on relief sculptures or relief carvings or whatever. So down here we have this vegetation and then up here above that we have what looks like livestock and then this middle register 
next we have what looks like nude men carrying vessels containers of what i believe have been identified as food also known as agricultural products um so there's that and then on top i don't think you can see her here but on the top register somewhere if you turn this thing around you're gonna see inanna you're gonna see inanna and i think they have this from different angles different perspectives um there they are and this is marvelous see this is why i like wikipedia look i don't know where they got this picture but here it is so this is a picture of the vase itself in its display case in at the sumerian gallery of the iraq museum so the vase is about one meter tall and then they put this outline of a human being i i assume like a full-grown man next to it just to give you an idea of how big it is and in in relation to a human being now where is inanna i want to show you inanna oh there she is so this this here i'm circling it with my cursor hopefully you can see that's inanna in this gown i i guess i could call it parts of it yes are missing who knows what kind of condition this thing was found in when they when they did find it in their archaeological dig or however they discovered it um but this vase is to honor the goddess Inanna. All right. And see, we've got the top registers here. You can click on these whenever you like um, in your own time. I will leave, like I always do, I will leave the links for all of these things that I discuss, all of the different pages that I discuss in the description of this video. Okay, and this is awesome too. The iconography of the upper register. Look at this. They've numbered everything one, two, three, four, uh, five, six, seven, eight. Number one is an unknown object. Okay. Number two, building or city. Number three, Inanna pole. Heaven knows what that is. Uh, harvest and number four harvest and vessel harvest harvest that's the key word harvest number five u shaped vessel number six lion shaped vessel and number seven unknown object it looks like bowls to me maybe bowls of i don't know grain i i, I don't know and it gives you the history behind this thing okay what happened? I guess it was stolen and then it restored and all of this. All right. So all the inf all of the pertinent information is here if you just want a good rundown of what's going on with this object, with this art object, ancient art object. We saw the dates. Where where are they? Thirty two hundred to three thousand BC. Okay. So as we can see, Wikipedia is still using BC rather than ce or bce mm. okay all right wikipedia whatever uh <laughs> i'm not going to say anything else about that but this thing this this thing obviously the highlighted subject that we've got going on here is a celebration of agriculture so inanna i guess by looking at this you can safely, safely assume that Inanna, the goddess, the deity, has something to do with that area of life, agriculture, food. All right, food is extremely important. We don't, we don't realize it if you're living in the United States. And yeah, yeah, the price of food is getting higher and higher and higher. Mm. Going to the grocery store is, is, It'll make you scream lately, within the last year or two. The prices have just been going up and up and up. But And so food is important, but we don't realize how important it is. Because we can acquire it so easily. We just go to the store. Whether the prices are high or not, 
you just go to the store and you buy a package of spaghetti or pasta, uh, any kind of pasta, rice, grain of any kind, meat, fish, poultry, dairy product, produce, and other things, prepared foods, sweets, candies, uh, hot food, etc., etc., so on and so forth, liquor, alcohol, soda, beer, you know, these things. You could get foods that are frozen. We don't realize how incredible that is, but it is incredible. Now, these people who were alive during this time in history, they didn't have none of that. And food was considered, at least, I would, I would assume that food would have been considered still a pretty big deal. They still marveled at it in some regard. Okay, so in Nana, we can safely assume, just by looking at this and just by looking at a quick rundown of what we have been looking at here, that this has a great deal to do with agriculture. This is a worship not just of the goddess Inanna, but also a worship of this thing that she probably represents or is probably connected to somehow in the mythological stories from this culture at this time in history, food, agriculture. Inanna is probably connected to food and agriculture or and or the concept of fertility. And fertility isn't just about uh, producing more people, you know, baby making. No, it's also about crops and soil and irrigation and creating more food, a fertile uh, field or soil to plant and cultivate and grow and harvest food. Harvest, harvest, harvest. We still celebrate this. Whether we know it or not, whether we like it or not, in November every year in the United States, it's called <clears throat> Thanksgiving. So these concepts have been around for a long, long, long time. Let me go on to the next one. What did I... I'm, I'm looking at this now, and I started off with this, the Mask of Varka. And this is important because it's yet another depiction of Inanna. Inanna as this goddess. Uh, we assume that it's Inanna. Here I go again with my control F. Because if it wasn't for control F, I would... Oh, saves me a lot of time. Anyway, the Mask of... I read this first sentence already dating from 3100 BC, so roughly around the same time as this thing, give or take a century, Varka Vase Inanna, uh, one of the earliest representations of the human face. The carved marble female face is probably a depiction of Inanna. It is approximately 20 centimeters or 8 inches tall and was probably incorporated into a larger wooden cult image, though it is only a presumption that a deity is represented. Yeah, it's a presumption, but it's probably a pretty good one. What else could it be at this time in history? They, they didn't have magazines back then. They didn't have celebrities like we have them now. So if you saw, at this time in history, if you were looking at a work of art featuring the human form or a human face in any way, shape, or form, it was most likely, or more likely than not, a representation of a deity or a ruler, or a ruler who was presenting themselves, who was presenting themselves. I don't even know if that's grammatically correct, but let's keep going. A, a leader or ruler who was presented as a deity, or in the guise of a deity. Okay, so that's what we're dealing with here. It was probably incorporated, I already read that, uh, a presumption that a deity is represented. It is without parallels in the period. This is why I wanted to discuss this as one of my <clears throat> works, my uh, in my Mesopotamian video series. This is why I wanted to discuss this one. Or actually, these two, this one and this one, they 
again, come from roughly the same time period. They're roughly dealing with not maybe the same, but very similar subject matter, whether it's directly or indirectly. We're looking at Inanna, presumably. Okay. Here, we're pretty sure it's Inanna. Here, we're not so sure, but what else could it be? Okay. It is without parallels in this period. It is in the National Museum of Iraq, having been recovered undamaged after being looted when the United States invaded Iraq in 2003. It could depict a temple goddess. Shells may have served as the whites of the eyes and lapis lazuli, a blue semi-precious gemstone, may have formed the pupils. Well, okay. What they, I don't know if they discuss this here, but I, I'm highlighting Inanna in my control F. Uh, the mask was found in the Iana or Iana district of the city, so named for the goddess Inanna to whom the temples are, that's why they're presuming. So that's, that's that. Um, it was discovered, as you can see here, the 22nd of February 1939 by the expedition of the German Archaeological Institute led by Dr. A. Nildeke in the city of Uruk, south of modern Baghdad. Okay, theft and recovery again. The, the, oh, didn't we just read about a theft and recovery here? Yep, <laughs> there it is. So I, ooh, this tells you something about archaeological finds. They be stealing, yeah? They, they steal them and then they recover them. How can I, yeah, yeah, I would be worried about how to authenticate and how to know whether or not you've recovered the actual original item. But that's just me. So they tell you a lot of stuff about this thing, but what they don't tell you, you know, they, they mention, uh, that shells and lapis lazuli were probably part of its eyes, the, these holes here, right? Um, the ears indicate that the image once wore jewelry. Parts of the eyebrows and hair were also emphasized with colored inlays. The back of the head is flat with drill holes for attachment. You can see all of that here. What they don't tell you, I don't think. Yeah, they don't. It was attached to, probably, probably attached to a wooden body. And that wooden body might have been dressed up in different outfits. Um, this thing, you know, they might have put eyeballs and various precious or semi-precious stones for the eyebrows, eyes, earrings, what have you. And they probably also put a wig on her, maybe a wig made of gold leaf, uh, stuff like that. So she would have been decked out, this Inanna character. And as I discuss her further, you'll see why. Let me get on to the next one. This. So I clicked on Inanna, Goddess Inanna, and this is what I found. All of the pages in the category Inanna, 65 of them, look. And again, all of these links will be in the description. <clears throat> Just take a look. I'll read through this. The ca this category is for articles relating to the Goddess Inanna. Inanna was worshipped in Sumer, at least as early as the Uruk period, circa 4000 BC to circa 3100 BC, but she had little cult before the conquest of Sargon of Akkad. During the post-Sargonic era, she became one of the most widely venerated deities in the Sumerian pantheon, with temples across Mesopotamia. So this cult the cult of Inanna slash Ishtar, because that's her other name, which may have been associated with a variety of sexual rites, was continued by the East Semitic-speaking people, Akkadians, Assyrians, and Babylonians, who succeeded and absorbed the Sumerians in the region. Okay. She was worshipped in Sumer, but she became popular during the Akkadian period, because of Sargon, of Akkad. Why? Why did this? They don't tell you about why, but that's okay. That's why I'm here. Uh, <laughs> they let me find my 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 link. 
where are we? Sargon, there he is. Sargon of Akkad. This article is about the Akkadian king. Okay. Sargon of Akkad, also known as Sargon the Great, was the first ruler of the Akkadian Empire. So the Akkadian Empire, he kind of um, kicked it off. Right? He was known for his conquest of the Sumerian city-states in the 24th to the to 23rd centuries BC. He is sometimes identified as the first person, this is important, the first person in recorded history to rule over an empire. <laughs> okay. He was the founder of the Sargonic or Old Akkadian dynasty, which ruled for about a century after his death until the Gutian conquest of Sumer. The Suker, uh, excuse me, the Sumerian king list makes him the cup bearer to King Ur Zababa of Kish. His empire is thought to have included most of Mesopotamia, parts of the Levant, besides incursions into Hurite and Elamite territory, ruling from his archaeologically as yet identified capital Akkad, also Agade. Sargon appears as a legendary figure in Neo-Assyrian literature from the 8th to 7th centuries BC. Tablets with fragments of a Sargon birth legend were found in the library of Ashurbanipal. Okay, it's getting complicated, isn't it? Isn't it getting complicated? And I'll, I'll scroll down because the one, you know, you might not recognize any of these images. You probably don't, as a matter of fact, recognize any of these images. But look it. This is one that you've probably seen all over the place. This thing down here. The so-called Mask of Sargon. After restoration in 1936. What happened to his face? We don't know. I mean, I don't know. I just, we, I'm not royalty. But <clears throat> I'll click on it. You've seen this. You've seen this in magazines. You've seen it on TV. You've seen it in YouTube videos. You've seen it in books. You've seen it in history textbooks, probably, when you were going to school. If you went to school. If you didn't, that's okay. Um, this thing. This thing. The braided hair and royal bun. I didn't know it was royal, but there you go. Reminiscent of... Da, 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 da. Uh, it is now thought to represent Sargon's grandson. <clears throat> this guy. This guy. Mm. Well, okay. That's interesting. That's very interesting because it's all interrelated, right? I guess that's why they call it the so-called Mask of Sargon. But you've seen this. And this, this is particularly interesting to me because it means something happened. What happened? I don't know. But something did happen. Somebody somewhere along the line damaged this thing. Is this, a, this is a defacing. This is, this looks violent. This looks like somebody was angry and they wanted to do damage to this thing. I don't have time to go into it now, but look up iconoclasm if you're interested and see what it is that motivates things like that, motivates the destruction of icons, which is what iconoclasm means. Um, usually there are changes taking place in society. Political, economic, social, there's wars going on. There's, you know, swift and violent uh, changes going on. Or somebody, some the old guard is being pushed out and the new guard is pushing their way in. And that's how things get destroyed like this. Works of art, religious works, and other kinds are damaged and destroyed, usually in war situations. So that's the, I'll leave it at that. So go ahead and look up iconoclasm when you want. But this is Sargon. This is Sargon of Akkad. He kicked off the Akkadian, um, where's my thing? Dynasty. Okay, so this, this is why I have this up. Uh, list of Mesopotamian dynasties. Really good resource. 
the history of Mesopotamia extends yet from the lower Paleolithic period until the establishment of the Caliphate in the late seventh century A.D. That's a long time. After which the region became uh, came to be known as Iraq. So what does this tell you? That just that sentence right there tells you that this part of the world has always been a problem. Tells you that this part of the world has always been <clears throat> going through it. Okay, in one way or another. Now this is supposed to be the cradle of civilization, mind you. Mind you that this part of the world is Mesopotamia, right? Mesopotamia, where are we? Um, Sargon. Yeah, I'll get to her later. Inanna. Mesopotamia. Okay. Mesopotamian, um, the ancient Mesopotamians. Mesopotamia means, and this is how every lecture in every survey course starts out with stuff like this. Mesopotamia means the land between two rivers. Which two rivers? The Tigris and the Euphrates. Why did people settle there after uh, the Stone Age, more or less, basically? Because there was water, fresh water, rivers, and that fresh water irrigated naturally the, the earth, the soil it, that surrounded that area, which made for a really good situation as far as agriculture goes. So it was good for them to... Cre what, 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 what am I trying... How am I trying to say this? To create a cultivated source of food. A semi... A predictable or semi-predictable source of food rather than hunting and gathering which was what we are told in history classes is what was going on before the formation of these, these civilizations in this part of the world. Mesopotamia is one of them, with all of its various um, dynasties and historical periods. As we can see, yeah, we start with the early dynastic period, and then, you know, Sumer, Akkad, what else, uh, Babylon, Mm, and we can go on and on, Assyria, etc., etc., and so on and so forth. So we have that going on here in the east, and a little little more west, what do we have? A very similar situation going on that I don't have time to discuss in this video, but I will in future videos, Egypt. Very similar situation, except rather than two rivers, they've got one, the Nile. That irrigated their grain fields and, and so on and so forth. So, that's Sargon, that's these Mesopotamian dynasties, which is, this is good to have on hand, these charts, so you can just quickly look things up when you see a date and you want to sort of put it in perspective in your head when you're thinking about this stuff, here it is, here it is, here it is. This is a great summary, you just click on these and it'll scroll you right down to what you want to know. Okay, um, but we were talking about <laughs> this one and this one, Inanna, Inanna. That's how I got started, and you know, Inanna, Sargon of Akkad, yeah, Mesopotamia, Akkadians, and so this cult of Inanna. I'm telling you, the art. We'll let you know what's going on. This art is telling us. If this is her, okay, then this is her. It probably is her, because remember, they're basing that off of where they found it. And this definitely probably is her, okay? And this cult lasted, what, a millennia, almost? Inanna was worshipped in Sumer, at least as early as the Uruk period, but she <laughs> had little cult had little cult, what? But she had little cult before the conquest of Sargon of Akkad. Okay, so she's been around, Uruk period. And then here comes Sargon, and he kicked off the Akkadian uh, dynasty. Okay, in the post-Sargonic era, she became the most widely venerated in the Sumerian pantheon with temples across Mesopotamia. I know I already read this, but it, it's 
worth repeating. And Wikipedia just put this at the top as kind of just an, um, a description of like why you're here to look at all of these other links that are alphabetized. Good luck with these. Oof. As, as great as Wikipedia is, there are still shortcomings. This is, I don't, I don't, mm -mm. this looks organized, but it's not. Trust me. Anyway, moving on. So Inanna, there she is. There she is. Inanna is an ancient Mesopotamian goddess associated with love, beauty, sex, war, justice, and political power. She was originally worshipped in Sumer under the name Inanna and was later worshipped by the Akkadians, Babylonians, and Assyrians under the name Ishtar. She was known as the Queen of Heaven and was the patron goddess of the Iana, Iana, sorry, Iana Temple at the city of Uruk, which was her main cult center. Are you getting an idea as I read these? Are you getting an idea of how life was organized at that time? What people were basically told to worship and do and go, where, where they were told to go and how, you know, what, what was kind of the nucleus of everything at the time as far as how cities were organized. This is it. Cult center Inanna. And so, there were other cult centers that involved other gods and goddesses or deities or whatever. Um, but we're talking about Inanna today because she, she seems to be really, really popular for whatever reason. I guess being associated with love, beauty, sex, war, justice, and political power, you know, that kind of covers everything, but whatever. Uh, she was associated with the planet Venus, and her most prominent symbols included the lion and the eight-pointed star. Ooh, those symbols are still around. You just have to know where to look for them. Remember my video? I'm going to have to go back to my page. I, I need to refer back to my page. Look at this. Iconography. Is it a sign? And if you remember what I discussed here, if you watched it in the first place, but that's okay, you, you, you can go watch it after this. Uh, iconography. Is it a sign? And I talk about this episode that is featured here, a scene or a still from the episode of the Alfred Hitchcock Hour titled The Sign of Satan, and Christopher Lee's character, Carl Yorla, what does he say? He says, once you've learned the sign of Satan, you begin to see it everywhere. The lion and the eight-pointed sign. I'm not saying these are satanic symbols. No, I'm just using the sign of Satan, the, the whole episode, and what Carl Yorla says as an analogy for what I'm trying to do here. That episode basically explains art history. <laughs> okay? Watch it. Watch my video. Watch my video. Please. Iconography, is it a sign? And then go and find a copy of the Alfred Hitchcock Hour, The Sign of Satan, and watch that all the way through. If it's available for rent on, on YouTube for rent, go ahead and spend the three bucks, whatever it is. It, you'll learn a lot, I promise. But anyway, Inanna, eight-pointed star and the lion, eh, she had a husband. His name was Dumuzi, or Dumuzit, or Tammuz. There he is, Tammuz. And her sukal, or personal attendant, was the goddess Ninshubur, I hope I pronounced that correctly, Ninshubur, who later became conflated with the male deities Leabrat and Papsukal. I hope I pronounced those correctly. But anyway, Inanna was worshipped, etc., 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 etc. So they give the same dates that we've already seen somewhere else. <laughs> During the post, oh yeah, this is a repeat. Um, so they're recycling things here, there, and everywhere on on um, Wikipedia. Now we have evidence of it. She was especially beloved by the Assyrians. Okay, great. So you can read through this on your own. This is not why I'm here. 
I'm just introing Inanna with this first paragraph and a little bit down here. Why am I here? This. Her descent into the underworld. Y'all. This story. This story. And I've provided you with a link to the translation. Of course, it's not going to be in the original whatever language they were speaking back then. But this is it. If you want to go through this whole big epic poem, one of the first, if not the first, ever written in the history of the world, um, be my guest. It's not easy to follow. Uh, you've got to be dedicated <laughs> to, to figure this out, to read through this and understand what's going on. Thank goodness for translations. Um, and thanks goodness, thank goodness for summaries. Two versions, okay. This, this is her story. This is her kind of main story. There, she's got a couple of them, but this is the most famous one for sure. The Descent into the Underworld. Two different versions of the story of Inanna Ishtar's Descent into the Underworld have survived. A Sumerian version dating to the Third Dynasty of Ur, these are the dates, circa 2112 BCE to 2004 BCE, okay? And a clearly derivative, ooh, the shade, a clearly derivative Akkadian version from the early 2nd millennium BCE. The Sumerian version was, of the story, sorry, I'll start over. The Sumerian version of the story is nearly three times the length of the later Akkadian version and contains much greater detail. Okay, so they talk about the Sumerian version, then they talk about the Akkadian version. Okay. And then they talk about interpretations in modern Assyriology. Okay. Other interpretations. Was this borrowed by other cultures and civilizations after these Mesopotamian ones? Probably. Then they talk about the Epic of Gilgamesh. Apparently that's related somehow. I'm not an expert in this stuff, by the way. This is why I need Wikipedia. I can tap dance through this and figure things out pretty quickly. But by no stretch of the imagination am I an expert in folklore or mythology. Oh, no, 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 no. But I'm just taking you through, taking you on a little tour. Um, so, Inanna... You know, where was I? For goodness sake, where was I? Oh yes, Descent into the Underworld. And I provide, pro provide you a link to this here. Inanna's Descent into the Netherworld. Underworld, Netherworld, whatever. And what is this place called, the Under or the Netherworld? In some places I've seen it referred to as Kur, K-U-R. In other places I've seen it referred to as Irkala, I-R-K-A-L-A. -A. Don't matter, it's the same place. It's downstairs underneath the ground. It's where you go when you die, as far as these Mesopotamians are concerned. And here's another one. The first epic poem, The Descent of Inanna. The first epic poem. I'm going to provide this link for you. You can look through this. Dr. Oliver Turrell uh, travels back over four millennia to find the oldest surviving epic poem. Wow. What's the oldest epic poem in the world? Did it all begin with Homer's Iliad? In one sense, we can grant this as an acceptable proposition, but if we wish to trace the true origins of the epic as a literary form, we need to go back considerably further into the very hazy early years of literary history. Mm-hmm. Okay. They talk about some stuff that I think is worth, I mean, I've read this, uh, I think it's worth worth it for you to read it too. So this poem kind of sets the stage, literally and figuratively, for writing, all writing, that will happen after it in the history of the world. Okay? Inanna, the descent of Inanna. And what one thing they don't tell you they don't seem to really um, focus on it, is who wrote this thing? Her. 
at least these, the, I guess, the later Akkadian version, right? Because this person, this woman, the high priestess of Nana in Hedwana, was the daughter of Sargon, of Akkad, this dude. All right, and she was a priestess to the moon god Nana in the Sumerian city-state of Ur, in the reign of her father Sargon of Akkad. She was likely appointed by her father as the leader of the religious cult at Ur to cement ties between the Akkadian religion of her father and the native Sumerian religion. Okay, this is more geopolitics going on here. It's been going on more or less since day one. Um, and again, you can read through this on your own. This is a marvelous resource. Attributed works, yes. The Exaltation of Inanna. Okay. They talk about this. She wrote a, she wrote a good deal about Inanna. And why am I mentioning this? Again, where, where, what I like to ask every now and again is where am I going with this and why? Because I need to remind myself because we started here. Okay. So it was, it was known. Inanna was known for, you know, almost a millennia, the Uruk period. But she didn't have much of a cult following until the conquest of Sargon of Akkad. <laughs> well, that we explained that here. Because Sargon of Akkad's daughter, in Hidwana, in her role as priestess, authored or did a remix of an older version of a myth about this Inanna deity, this goddess of everything. War, love, fertility, uh, etc. That's how Inanna's cult gained its following. Promotion, advertising, uh, marketing, I guess we would call it now branding, maybe, maybe. Um, so Enhedwana is the one who kind of kicked that off thanks to her father putting her in a very prominent position. If, I mean, if this isn't nepotism, I don't know what is. So, she wrote this thing. The uh, tale of Inanna's descent into the underworld or netherworld. Oh, and we have this as well. Um, yes, I, I'm going to link to this. And, and I'm going to link to this too, Ancient Mesopotamian Religion. I'm showing this to you. Because we have this here, right? I do control F. There she is, Inanna, sex and war deity. Apparently they go together, right? If, if the same deity represents both of them, that means they're linked, sex and war. Uh, with the later one of uh, King Hammurabi. Okay, we're not here to talk about Hammurabi. I will talk about him in another video. But uh, Inanna, okay, I'll re we, oh. Okay, where are we? The worship of Inanna slash Ishtar, which was prevalent in Mesopotamia, could involve, oh, good heavens, wild, frenzied dancing and bloody ritual celebrations of social and physical abnormality. It was believed that nothing is prohibited to Inanna, mm -hmm. and that by depicting transgressions of normal human social and physical limitations, including, oh dear, traditional gender definition, one could cross over from the conscious everyday world into the trance world of spiritual ecstasy. Mm -hmm. Well, well, well. Isn't that something? I sound like the church lady. From if you're if you're old enough to know, you know what I'm talking about. But so this is this is what they chose to include in the article about ancient Mesopotamian sorry ancient Mesopotamian religion. Interesting. With regard to Inanna, when they're talking about Inanna, that's what they talk about: the frenzied celebrations and rituals and etc. Uh, that involved her or were dedicated to her. Okay, so we have this as well. I want you to look at this again. I featured this in my intro to the Mesopotamian stuff video, but I'm talking about it again. I'm featuring it again because it's important. 
list of Mesopotamian deities. Why? Because of this marvelous chart. Okay, and they talk about, where's the thing? Major deities, primordial beings, minor deities, monsters and apotropaic spirits, and foreign deities, and then, of course, don't ever forget to look at. See also. That's where the real learning happens. But, so, Inanna's a major deity. That's where I'm getting at here. Inanna, Venus, okay, descent into the underworld. You see, I've been here already. In which she attempts to conquer the underworld, the domain of her older sister, Erish Kigal. This is Erish Kigal. I'm not going to click on that because I'm going to do a whole other thing on Erish Kigal. But she is instead struck dead by the seven judges of the underworld. Okay. And it takes Enki. Where is he? This guy. One of the main ones, one of the top dogs in this hierarchy of, of deities, takes Enki to intervene to save her. And her husband, Dumuzi, I call him Dumuzi, they call him Dumuzi, is forced to take her place in the underworld alongside, <laughs> ay, 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 alongside her twin brother Utu, this guy up here. Um, Inanna was the enforcer of divine justice. What what doesn't she do? She just she just does it all: war, sex, fertility, uh, justice. This is weird. At least to me, it is. To me, it seems a little odd, but that's just me. Okay, so already, and here she is again: the page on Inanna. All right, origin myths. All right, where she's mentioned, how she's mentioned, they they f feature the Uruk vase, among other images. Okay, what is this? What did I just click on? Oh, God. Emblem of the goddess Inanna, ring posts of Inanna. I don't know what those are. Ring posts of Inanna on each side of a temple door with naked devotee offering libations. Okay, cool. The ring reed post. Okay. So this is something that is worth researching. It is, it was often beribboned and positioned at the entrance of temples and marked the limit between the profane and the sacred realms. Well. This changes everything. At least for me it does. Okay, I'm going to key you in into something. I might be coming back to this page and this discussion of this when I talk about temples. Not temples in the Mesopotamian world, but temples in Egypt and Greece and Rome. I, 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 I just thank you, YouTube. If I hadn't been making this video, I wouldn't have made this discovery. So anyway, Inanna symbol, the reed ring post. Interesting, 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 interesting. Anyway, um, iconography. Eight-pointed star. Remember this thing? Hmm. It's everywhere. Once you've learned the sign, I'm going to keep coming back to that. Once you've learned the sign of fill in the blank, you begin to see it everywhere, don't you? At least I do, and that's why we're here. So... <laughs> I hope I haven't confused you too much. I'm not done. And Hedwana, the author of the Inanna story, her father Sargon of Akkad, very, very influential ruler, who was worshipped well beyond his death. Okay? List of Mesopotam Mesopotamian deities. No, not deities, sorry, dynasties. Deities is over here somewhere. Re religion. And these are the deities. I'm sorry. They're so, see... I've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen tabs open, and I'm having trouble keeping them all straight. But, okay, so we're still, I still haven't told you why, what, what I, what I'm here to tell you. I told you a lot, didn't I? We started off here, didn't we? Mask of Varka and the Varka vase. These two very innocuous looking things, probably because they're old and beat up, 
But even when they were young, they weren't huge. Okay, this is only three meters tall. Yes, it would have been painted. Yes, it probably would have been very brightly colored. Same thing with her over here. I told you, she would have had a wig made of gold leaf and jeweled eyes and eyebrows and earrings, jewelry. The lower half of her, from the neck down, would have been a body of some kind, probably made of wood, and probably de dressed to the nines. And that was Inanna. She was, I guess, uh, a clothes horse, as, as one would say. I don't know if the young people say that anymore, but that's what they used to call somebody who was very into fashion and looking good and whatever. That was definitely Inanna. So when we look at the use of the female body in advertising, for example, like that's a hot button issue, isn't it? Yeah, the representations of beauty, that's all anybody can talk about sometimes on, you know, whenever you switch on the TV or you look at social media or whatever, people are harping on and on and on about how women's bodies are used. You can thank her. I'm showing you how early it got started, Inanna. And this, this is why I'm really here. This is my favorite part of any discussion that has to do with Inanna. This story written by somebody in Sumer that I need to look up. The Sumerian version. Does it tell us who the author of the Sumerian version was? Ugh, I don't see it. But then again, I'm not looking that hard. Um, so. And Hedwana. I'm not saying she plagiarized. No, but she definitely did a remix of this original Sumerian version. And I think Enhedwana's version became maybe the popular one because it was shorter. This older version contains more details. Details are important. Probably not to the general public, but probably to the priest class, the upper classes of this society. The priest class was the, they were the elites as, as well as the rulers and whatever kind of administrators or, uh, you know, the equivalent to what we have in our world as far as celebrities and politicians and wealthy people, right? Those details, those details. So Inanna's descent into the other underworld. I'll give you a quick summary. She decides she's having a great time in the upper world. She's really, really got it made as a goddess. Okay, and one day... She decides that she wants to visit the land of the dead. For what, for what reason, I'm not sure. But it, and, and the poem doesn't seem to give really a good enough reason that sounds believable. Uh, it says, first line, from the great heaven she set her mind on the great below. Okay, so Inanna is the queen of heaven. And sh that's not good enough for her, so she wants to go visit the underworld or the netherworld or whatever you want to call it. Her excuse for wanting to visit the underworld or netherworld or whatever you want to call it was she said she wanted to attend the funeral of her sister, Erish Kigal's husband. Or what was his name? I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I can't remember right now. Um, it's in here. It's in here somewhere. Oh, yes, the funeral rites of Gugalana, the husband of my elder sister, Ereshkigal. Okay, so. That's her stated reason. She asked, she has to ask permission from, where's the thing? Oh, Lord. She has to ask permission from, yeah, here we are, from these, uh, Major deities, not major deities, what am I saying? There's another word for them that I can't, oh yes. Yes, 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 yes. So there's these four primary deities, and then there's the sky gods, of which Inanna is one, along with her brother Utu, and then the moon god Nana, to whom Enhedwana, the author of this epic Inanna poem, was dedicated. She was the priestess of the moon god Nana. Okay, so... She, Inanna can't just make a decision and go into the underworld, even though she is a goddess. No, she has to ask permission from these up here. 
And they tell her no. And she says, what? No, you can't tell me I can't go. And they say, no, 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 you can't go. And the reason why they say, no, 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 you can't go, is because there are rules and regulations, even for goddesses, as far as the underworld is concerned. You can't just go flouncing in there whenever you like. Because the underworld is this very serious place. It's a place of death. This is where everything, I guess, goes. When it dies, when people die, they go into the underworld, never to be seen or heard from ever again. It's a place of finality. Okay? And once you get in there, you can't get out. And that includes her. What's interesting in this story is that Eresh Gigal's husband is dead. <laughs> Eresh Gigal, you know, kind of presides over the underworld. And her husband, I guess, is there with her, and he, he dies. But if he's in the underworld, he's already kind of dead? I don't know. I don't know. I need to look that up. But, and, you know, th these are Inanna's stated reasons, her alleged reasons for wanting to visit the underworld and she keeps harping on these where are they these people people these these gods the primary deities and they finally relent and they say okay fine if you want to do this if you want to be stupid and, and go and do this what you shouldn't be doing go ahead but they provide her with some warnings and a plan for not if but when things go wrong and she says, yeah, 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 whatever. So she, you know, she's proud and she's arrogant and full of herself. And her, like I said, her stated reason for going is to attend the funeral of her sister, Eresh Kigal's husband. That might be just a ruse for something else. Maybe she wants to usurp her sister in some way, shape or form. I don't know. Apparently they don't like each other. Erish Kigal and Inanna. So Inanna wanting to attend this funeral is very odd. Um, doesn't make sense at all. So anyway, she goes and she has to pass through seven gates in order to finally enter, like really enter and be in the underworld. And she shows up at the first gate, dressed to the nines, like I was talking about with this statue and how it was probably decked out when it was brand new and people were passing by it and looking at it and whatever, right? And this is how Inanna was probably dressed when she went to attend this funeral, very inappropriately dressed, um, of her sister's husband, right? And she, and you can look through these links and I saw it in here, but she pounds on the door of the underworld demanding to be let in. And they finally let her in. And every time she passes through each one of these seven gates, she has to remove an article of clothing. And after she's done all of that, she's finally passed through the seventh gate. She's, she's naked like a pluck chicken. She's also powerless after they've uh, removed or forced her uh, to remove an article of clothing as a condition of her entry or passing through each gate. So when she finally gets through the seventh gate, she's totally but a ball naked. Okay. And probably bald. They probably took her wig too. And her jewelry and everything. And then she finally gets to go see the sister of hers, Eresh Kigal. And Eresh Kigal is not too pleased. None too pleased to see her sister, Inanna. I told you they don't like each other. And <clears throat> Inanna is there, like I said, butterball naked. Erish Kigal is pissed. And Erish Kigal, you know, I won't get into detail, but Erish Kigal is just really, really upset and angry that Inanna would have the gall, uh, the, what do they say, the nerve, the audacity, and the unmitigated gall to actually come and do what she's done force her way into the underworld, manipulate the gods, the upper gods, the superior gods, into giving her permission to do this in the first place, and then actually coming in, like I said, flouncing into the underworld, dressed the way she was dressed, again, 
probably not appropriate for, for a funeral. And then she comes before Eresh Kigal, again, with that arrogance and that nerve and, and etc. And Eresh Kigal, being her sister, probably knows why she's really there or has an idea. And Eresh Kigal is very angry. And what Eresh Kigal does is what we've been expecting. So for, you know, this story, the, the gods, those primary gods, what are their names? Whatever, doesn't matter. They warn her. They say, oh, no, no, this is not a good idea. Don't do this. You'll re you'll regret it. Because there's a really good chance if you go in there, you're never going to come out because nobody does. And she just doesn't heed any of these warnings. Anyway, so Eresh Kigal gets very angry and kills her. She kills Inanna for being so arrogant and, and probably having some ridiculous plan. Maybe she's there even, I don't know, I'm just guessing speculating. Maybe she's there even to usurp Eresh Kigal. Who the hell knows? But Eresh Kigal isn't taking any chances and she kills Inanna dead. And then what she does is she has Inanna hung um, her body. She has Inanna's body hung on a meat hook uh, on a wall somewhere in the underworld. And Inanna's body rots. It decomposes, it rots, it starts to stink, it turns green, it's gross. And so Inanna is, has been killed and her body is rotting in the underworld because her sister Erish Gigal was just sick of Inanna's nonsense and so on and so forth. And then after that, that's when Inanna's, you know, um, backup plan kicks in and she has peop people other other figures in the story ready to spring to action if she's been gone yeah i think that was that was the agreement if i'm not mistaken don't quote me read the story but the the agreement was okay if i'm not back after so long what you know however long days or i don't know that come get me all right come get me and she has her assistants come get her and figure it out and, and rescue her from the underworld with the tools that were given to Inanna from the primary gods in order to make that possible. Okay, so they save Inanna. And Eresh Gigal is still pissed. Okay, so they saved Inanna and Eresh Gigal, you know, they, they revive her. They bring her back to life and I guess reconstitute her corpse, you know, kind of like a raisin or a prune or whatever um or beef jerky i don't know but they rescue her they revive her and erish kigal is still very very angry and erish kigal demands a substitute for inanna's death and inanna gets to pick the substitute which is so weird because Inanna's the one who like made this mess in the first place. But I, it doesn't matter. So Inanna chooses, she has this, you know, the, the, this uh, collection of people or collection of figures or characters that surround her in her life to choose from. And she bases her choice on who did or didn't mourn her when she was dead in the underworld. And, you know, her beautician did mourn her, and this other one did mourn her. And the one who didn't mourn Inanna's absence or death was her husband. We've seen his name a couple of times um, in our readings here. Dumuzi. Dumuzi. Uh, the shepherd. Hmm. And he's associated with bulls. Bovine creatures. Uh, Dumuzi was just thrilled to bits that she was gone because she treated him horribly. Again, this Inanna, she was arrogant, prideful. A mess. Just an absolute mess. And she has this Dumuzi husband who is basically, as far as I know, if I'm not mistaken, he's considered a demigod. All right. So she, he is the one that she chooses to take her place because he didn't mourn her. And then Dumuzi's sister, who's named Geshtinana, is very upset by Inanna choosing Dumuzi to take her place in the underworld. So Geshtinana says, okay, look, you can have Dumuzi, 
and have him be dead for six months out of the year, and then I, Geshenana, will take his place for the rest of the year, the other half of the year, and that way Erish Kigal will be um, placated. Okay. And then, but you know, that, that's, that's basically it. <laughs> that's my summary of the epic of Inanna's descent into the underworld. And there she is. I've put her up so you can get a good look at her. Notice her nose is missing. Don't, you know, this, this statue has been defaced as well. When the nose is missing, that is deliberate. Um, so yeah, that was the summary <laughs> of the Inanna's descent into the underworld. And this story, this mythological story, in this case, uh, authored or remixed by somebody like Enhedwana. It's for the purpose of doing something, explaining something as far as mythology and the effect that the deities and their exploits in the world of the gods and goddesses and whatever, how that might influence the world of the living and the people who are alive and working and doing whatever they're doing in this Mesopotamian, Sumerian, Akkadian world at this time in history. It might explain stuff like seasons. It might explain stuff like fertility, why at certain times of the year the soil is fertile and there's plenty of food growing and at other times of the year there's not. It might explain wars. It might explain f famines. It might explain all kinds of things. Or it might be used to do that. Now, this is one of the first stories, whether it's epic or not, one of the first stories ever written. That's That's one of the reasons why it's so significant this story of Inanna, okay? Why? Because basically it's these Sumerians, Mesopotamians, whatever, are considered to have basically invented writing, the cuneiform writing that you've probably heard of. And writing was not created or invented so that people could write stories with it, stories like this one. No. Writing was created for the purpose of accounting and keeping track of stuff. When I say stuff, I mean property. Livestock, probably land, bush bushels of grain, and, and whatever else constituted wealth or money. At this time in history, that's why writing was invented. These poems, you know, literature, art, whatever you want to call it, that was that was just extra that that was just sort of an add-on pleasant but not the reason for its invention not the reason for writing's invention and agriculture i talked about it already but uh we, actually i talked about it with the varka vase because on the varka vase this is one of the things that's featured prominently. It's in the lower registers, but prominently on the Varka base. Livestock and crops. I don't know if this is grain or something, something along those lines, but you know, animals that are meant to be slaughtered and eaten and vegetables, fruits, vegetables. And that's what these nude men are carrying. Like when I started out this video, I said they are, they are carrying vessels, containers that are filled with food also known as agricultural products. So we have writing, we have agricultural products, we have basically a full transition from the prehistoric or Stone Age world of hunting and gathering and living in caves and whatever they were doing into this, what we call civilization. And civilization is based on, or based upon, whatever, is based on a predictable or semi-predictable source of food, which is where agriculture comes in. And when agriculture comes into history, then we have also another product of civilization, wealth. And writing was created to keep track of it all. 
then as this evolved, this writing thing, um, and again, all of these links will be in the description, as this writing thing evolved, then they started writing poetry and possibly keeping records as far as what was going on politically or militarily or, you know, what have you in, in their history at their time when they were doing their thing. Um, but art was, you know, creating art. It wasn't the primary purpose of writing. And even when this art was created, whether it was this poem or this, okay, oh, this is an interesting picture. Let me put this up here. Not a very good one. Sorry. Uh, this, okay, I'll put her in the National Museum of Iraq. Her or this vase or this thing. Yes, I'll talk about it eventually. Um... That art had a job to do, whether it was a poem, epic poem by Enhedwana or anybody else, whether it was this stele, whether it was a statue, whether it was a vase, whether it was a relief carving. Oh, it wasn't what we think of as art or the purpose that we believe art fulfills. No. Art had a job to do. And as I do my video series in various subjects and things, you might begin to see what I believe that job was and is still right into the current modern day. So, oh my goodness, I've been talking for one hour and 16 minutes at this point. Did I forget something? Oh, yes, I did. This. I'll put this up too. And Hedwana, politician, priestess, poet, and scientist. Okay. Why did I put this here? And I'm glad I didn't forget about this. I almost did. Um, it's one of my few non-Wikipedia links. Okay, look at this. And Hedwana, politician, priestess, poet, and scientist. Okay. The compiler of the tablets was in Hedwana. My king, something has been created that no one has created before. So in Hedwana, as you can infer from this one quoted line from the temple hymns, right? She was kind of a innovator of her own kind, in her own right. She used writing in this way. She is one of the first people that we know of, maybe the first person that used writing for this purpose, whatever it was. We call it the creation of art. We call it the creation of literature or a poem. Okay. Again, that art, that literature, that poem had a job to do. So this wasn't just, you know, some lazy rich kid um, publishing their little book of poems. No. No, 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 no. This poem and others that she wrote and etc. had a job to do. And... You know, if you want some idea of what kind of job her poem was trying to do, you can ch check out my Hunter Biden art review series. It's there. It's all there. I'll show you. Here it is. Okay, back to this last link that I want to talk about before I let you go. Um, <laughs> there's a reason that I clicked on this. One match. Bible. Besides these three poems, Enhedwana composed three to Nana as well as the 42 temple hymns. Okay, cool. Her writings form the first... Hello? Her writings form the first written religious belief system. And, according to Paul Krivatsete, Krivatsete, Let's hope, let's hope I pronounce that correctly. Paul, we'll just call him Paul. According to Paul, uh, it influenced the prayers and psalms of the Hebrew Bible and the Homeric hymns. So people in the ancient world, going as far back as the authors of the Bible, whoever they were, and the Homeric hymns, we're influenced by 
this guy's daughter. Okay? And Hedwana. We there, I guess this is a depiction of her. No, this is Inanna. What am I saying? Oh, I'm looking for Aunt Hedwana. Which, uh, another interesting thing. Aunt Hedwana wasn't her real name. No, Aunt Hedwana just means priestess to the moon god Nana. That's what Aunt Hedwana me means. But her real name? No clue. None. I, you would think that we would know, especially if she was, you know, this guy's daughter. Um, but we don't. But what we do know is what she wrote in her lifetime, in her role as the priestess, a very, very important upper-class function at the time. She was very influential, not just in her own lifetime. Her and her writings were very influential well after her death. All right, and influencing even things, something like the Bible or the Homeric hymns. So yes, I will leave this link in the description for you to look at, if and when you'd like to. Oh, and in my... And I, now, well, maybe I shouldn't make a promise because I'm not good at keeping them, but I'll try anyway. Next time I do want to talk about Naramshin, because, again, all of these Mesopotamian works of art have to do with religion, in some way, shape, or form. It's inescapable. I don't know when it's going to be, because I just made the intro video for uh, Mesopotamia the other day. Yes, here it is. Some, it has no views, so it just dropped today, so don't judge me. But um, I, I, I made this Inanna video, and I'm happy about it. But I don't know when I'm going to make the next one in my Mesopotamian series, the Naramshin video. I would like to get into some other videos, some other topics. Maybe Egypt, maybe, like I was talking about in my announcement video from earlier, um, you know, the life of Christ as it's depicted in art, cathedrals, Marian depictions, Marian art which means depictions of the Virgin Mary. I'm still working on my Hunter series. I'm still working on my Shining series. I mighty, oh, oh, I, I just keep adding to my list. Um, I want to talk about the movie The Exorcist, because, yes, it relates to Mesopotamian art. But I also want to talk about um, that horror movie, fairly recent, not maybe a couple of years old, the movie Hereditary with Tony Collette. I want to talk about that one. So anyway, oh gosh. So I hope I've given you a good intro to this Inanna character, figure, goddess, deity, and the author of her most popular uh, poem, In Hidwana, and in Hedwana's father, Sargon, and also giving you, you know, this is a little, just keep going, and you run into this list of Mesopotamian dynasties, and religion, and deities, and gosh, where where are we here? Was this, oh yeah, Inanna herself, um, why she's important, why she's considered to be important, and so on and so forth. I have been talking for an hour and 23 minutes. And I've enjoyed every second of it. However, um, in again, in future videos, I'll be covering all the things that I said I'll be covering, and more. There will be more. So, at this point in the video, I want to remind you to keep an eye out for um, any giveaway that I, that I announce uh, this week, if I, I think I'll announce it in the Shining video for this week. So, yeah, keep an eye out for that. Um, also, if you haven't subscribed to my channel, make sure and do that because I can't wait to see more, more people watching my videos. Um, please do, you know, remember to subscribe, like, comment, Share the video if you think that this is worth sharing. Please feel free to do it. Uh, and until next time, until the next time I talk at you about whatever it is 
that I'm going to be talking at you. I wish you well. I want to thank you for watching this video or any others that you've watched. And until next time, once again, until next time, I'm going to go ahead and bid you bye-bye. So, bye-bye, everybody.